Okay. So the nine days beginning last Shabbat and finishing this coming Shabbat are the days where we focus on really the rebuilding of the Beis HaMikdash. Because the whole idea of the destruction is really just the rebuilding. As we saw from Rabbi Akiva, this was when it was so fresh, right after the, the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, and the ruins were still there. And he was walking with two of his colleagues, and it was very, very sad and very bitter to see the ruins. They remembered the Beis HaMikdash in its full glory. And not only were the ruins, but there were foxes right, running through the ruins. And his two friends were crying and mourning, and he said, he started to laugh. I said, how could you laugh? You know, you just, you, you, can't, ha like, you can't handle, what do you start laughing in this such a sad situation? He said, because there's a prophecy that says, Shu'alim hil chubai. It says that foxes, Hashem, right after the fall of communism, and it was a very, very exciting time. Many yeshiva boys were going to help out and give Jewish experiences to the youth there because you have to understand they grew up. Most of them were not even told they were Jewish. The parents were so afraid to even have any display that they were Jewish because of the government then and the atheism and the punishments for displaying any sign of Judaism. And all of a sudden, it's over. It was like, the greatest joy, but also such, such ignorance. Like what, from, 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 from zero to build up Jewish knowledge. And so they came to, for a few months to Russia, and they had a summer camp, and they had, um, you know, they made a Lagba Omer program, and different things for the youth. And it's amazing, the sponges, they were so excited, because you know what? It was like water to a parched soul. Their neshama was always there, even though, they had no consciousness of it. These kids never were told, you are Jewish. So many of them. But the neshama was like in prison, in captivity inside of them all these years. That it was like such a refreshing time to learn the Aleph Bet and to sing the songs and Shabbat and the Brachot and Brit Milah. Many of them chose to get a bris at an older age. And so after these few months, these two boys wrote a report to the Rebbe. They wrote a letter to the Rebbe thanking the Rebbe for the experience and also giving a detailed report of everything they did. The camp and the activities and the mitzvahs that they taught them about, the Torah that they learned. And the kids took on Jewish names. They didn't have Jewish names like Shabbos candles from nothing. And included in the letter was another letter that the community had written to the Rebbe to thank the Rebbe for sending these boys. And they said, please send this, you know, to the Rebbe. And they wrote a whole letter of appreciation. And at the end, Many of them signed their name in Russian, but a few of them, you could tell there was so much effort put in. They painstakingly wrote their name in Hebrew. They just learned the Aleph bit. They just learned, like, uh, barely learned how to write, and they tried so hard. You could tell maybe they copied it from somewhere else. Like, you know, very, very beginning, like a pre a first grader writing, you know? These are the leaders, some of them in the community, or even the older kids. Anyways, the Rebbe writes back a letter. And the Rebbe says, specifically to the people who wrote the thank you letter, the people from Russia, the Rebbe said, I could see from your letter that your neshama is shining radiantly. That your neshama is shining in full glory. Now, what does that mean for our neshama to shine in full glory? Really what it means is for Hashem's presence to be revealed within our own consciousness. And that really means for the base Hamikdash, the miniature base Hamikdash that's inside each one of us to be built. Because what is, yeah, and your husband will give us the Birkat Kohanim and your sons when the when Mashiach comes in the base Hamikdash. So really, it says that when Hashem first gave the first commandment to build a sanctuary that He can dwell inside, because that's what the base Hamikdash is, that His Shechina can dwell. It says Ve'asu li Mikdash. Make for me a dwelling place and I will dwell inside of them. So grammatically it doesn't make sense because if you're talking about a dwelling place, you say, I will dwell inside of it. So Rashi explains, 
Betochem, why did it say, um, as Shachanti Besocham, Betochem? Betoch kal achad ve achad mi Yisrael. I am going to dwell by having this physical structure. What is it going to cause? Such a revelation that all of a sudden the godliness that's in every single Jew is going to be so revealed and shining that now not only am I going to dwell in that physical structure, but you're going to see that every single Jew is a miniature structure. Their neshama is going to be shining brilliantly because the base of is there. Right now, we don't have the physical base of Mikdash, but every mitzvah is eternal. We have the ability to be walking Beis HaMikdash. And by doing that, we bring the real Beis HaMikdash and the yearning to have it because we can't really have as much of a closeness to Hashem. We can't keep all the mitzvot. There's also a lack in peace. There's a lack in health. There's a lack in the things that we need to really serve Hashem in full, full glory. So yes, even though we're going to work on building our own Beis HaMikdash, it's not enough. Our goal is to bring down the physical structure. So it's the opposite. First, Hashem said, build the physical one. Then I'm going to be, you're going to be so inspired by it just being there. You're all going to be walking Beis HaMikdash. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry, I gave you this one. I'm just like... <coughs> so we are, we're doing it the other way, which is actually even a stronger effect when we do the work ourselves, make each one of us into Beis HaMikdash, and then all of a sudden we kind of like inspire Hashem to bring the physical structure down. It actually says... How are we going to rebuild Yerushalayim? It says, Tzion v'mishpat tipade v'shaveha b'tzdaka. Tzion is going to be redeemed through mishpat, through justice. V'shaveha and its captives will return through tzedakah. So there's a very long Hasidic discourse that the Baal HaTanya writes on this. And he says, it seems like it's kefa lashon, right? Tzion v'mishpat tipade, it's like a, a double expression. The Torah usually is very precise and concise also. Like if it doesn't need to expound on something, it won't. And it seems like it's a repetition. Tzion is going to be redeemed through Mishpat and the captives of Tzion, which are the, what is Tzion? Because Tzion is its captives, which explained in the commentaries, with Tzedakah. So after a long, lengthy, lengthy, amazing discussion about the power of every neshama, which is so brilliant, our neshamas are literally a piece of Hashem that is higher than anything that's created. That existed one with Hashem before He even thought to create the world. So our nesh- how could it be that a neshama that is so lofty, so great, every single Jew is walking around with one, even if they don't know they're Jewish. How could it be that we're in this world here, that we're in a body? How is that possible? So every morning we say, Alokai neshama shenasata bi tahorahi. Hashem, the neshama that you gave me is tahora. It's pure. It's brilliant. It's complete. It's wholesome. It's untainted. Ata barasa, you created it. Ata barasa, ata nafachta bi, you blew into me. But what I wanted to focus on is ata mishamra bikirbi. You're constantly guarding it inside of me. It says that it's a huge miracle that the body and the soul are together. Every single moment Hashem is like guarding it because it's this huge fire of Hashem inside of us and for it to be contained in a physical vessel that doesn't even recognize at all times its existence is a huge miracle but it's for a reason it's because when we can reveal it even for a moment in our entire 24 hours of the day we've built the base of English for that moment so our goal is to really try to expand that minute because as much as we expand it the more Hashem just like the Rebbe wrote to these people I see your neshama shining brilliantly does that mean that now they're all tzaddikim, gemurim, every single moment they're neshama shan? No, at the time where you are recognizing that and appreciating the mitzvahs that you did, I see your neshama shining brilliantly. So we have to take those moments and expand them so that we have as many Beis HaMikdash, Mashiach moments where our neshama is in our consciousness. And that's why B'mishpat. How are we, um, how are we redeeming Tzion? Mishpat. Mishpat is Torah. Every time we learn Torah, like we're doing right now, every person now, your neshama is shining brilliantly. Because it says, Tzion b'mishpati pade. We are redeeming Tzion through mishpat, through Torah, v'shaveha, and its captives, b'tzdaka. So what is the accomplishment of tzdaka? Why do we need tzdaka if Torah learning is anyways going to 
redeem our souls? It's because Torah learning is going to reveal our souls in our rational consciousness. That now, the more I'm aware, when I learn Torah, I'm aware of God's wisdom. I see things differently. I understand. But what about my emotions? What about the drama I have? And the things that I'm just still so brought down by, or the things that I get excited about that are so trivial, the things that are so not godly, that's all still inside of me. That's like the captives. That we need a higher force, which is tzedakah. If you think of it, every Sunday, the Rebbe will give dollars, stand for hours. You think the Rebbe is revealing Chidushe Torah, new ideas in Torah, every time the Rebbe's mouth opens, revealing to us the secrets, giving advice to people on Barachas. So why hours and hours to be busy with tzedakah? Because tzedakah is actually what then releases another part of our soul and re- helps us to shine the godly light through our emotions. So we need the Torah and the tzedakah and, and the davening. So I'm going to actually go through three different services that happened in the Beis Mikdash on a daily basis. We don't have the Beis Mikdash now, but it's so amazing how we can actually see what the deeper meaning of those services are and apply it now in our daily life. And then I'm so excited that Miriam has brought so many props from the actual Beis Mikdash and for us to learn a lesson from the different parts of the Beis Mikdash also that are a part of us and how we can make that a part of our daily life. So, first of all, we say in davening every day, Unishama parim svasenu. We can't give the cows parim, we don't have the sacrifices, but we complete the service through our lips. When we learn about the Beis Hamikdash, when we daven, we're actually completing in a spiritual way the same exact service that they did with the animals. Even we're completing it in a way they didn't. Because what they did was they would bring the animal, but the Kohen would be the one to slaughter it, bring it up, and they would watch. Listen to the music. When we daven, we, every single individual says the blessings of the karbanot, which we're not even going to do when Mashiach comes. We're not, we're not the ones slaughtering. We're not the ones sprinkling the, 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 the blood, <clears throat> which all has a very deep spiritual significance. So we're actually able, we're completing a type of service that the Jews who did get to do it didn't do. And then it's like a full puzzle bringing us to the Beis HaMikdash. So what was the first thing of the day? I think the first thing in the Beis HaMikdash must be like this, like, what do they do every day? The first thing, the first part of the service. The first part of the service was actually called Trumat Hadeshen. What was that? There were ashes that were on the Mizbeach that were left from the sacrifices the day before. And they would take a lottery and they would choose one Kohen who would be his turn that day to do Trumat Hadeshen. And what would he do? He would remove the ashes from the Mizbeach. Some of them... He would put it into the ground in the Azara. So it was in a very holy place right next to the Mizbeach. He would put the ashes there and they would sink into the ground. And they, they were part of this, the holy place of the Mizbeach. The other ashes, he would have to take very, very far outside of the holy camp and leave it there. So what does this represent to us? We don't have the ashes. We don't have the... Uh, we don't have the karbanas these days, but we actually can still do this service. So the ashes is called dashan, but it's also pisolet. It means pisolet is when there's something left over, you know, that's negative. You don't need it. There's always going to be something pisolet. So you have the, the, the main part of the animal, which was actually went up in smoke and was offered and accepted by Hashem. But then you have the pisolet. The pisolet is like, I don't want to say the garbage, but like the leftover not usable stuff in our life. What does the psalat represent in our life spiritually? There are two different types of psalat. It's called atzvot and merirot. Our job, and I'll explain, our job as a Jew is ibdu as Hashem b'simcha. We must serve Hashem with joy. Through all times of our day, through all times of our life, it is incumbent upon us to be joyous. A Jew equals happy. We must have a joy when we serve Hashem. There is a time and place though for a certain bitterness. And what does that mean? It's like having a remorse over the state of my neshama, uh, a lost opportunity, I could have done something better. I mean, look, we're coming, these are our days of teshuva, we're coming towards Elo. There is a time in Yiddishkeit to have this mirirus. But there's something called merirut and there's something called atzvot. Merirut is a bitterness. A bitterness is actually something that could, is, could still be part of our service. Why? 
it leads to something very joyous. It's like, you know when you, you some very, very simple, I could relate to it, like someone who keeps on losing their keys, right? And all of a sudden they decide, that's it. I'm not losing my keys anymore. I'm gonna get a certain box, that is a magnet, I keep it here. And the joy that comes every time they open that box, like, oh, I didn't lose my keys, I have a plan, I have it here. It's like a joy that you never had before because it's always like, oh, maybe I'm losing, maybe I'm not, I keep on losing them. So that's me rewrite. It's like a bitterness. First, you're upset. How come I keep on losing this? Or how come this keeps on happening? How come I have this bad habit? But it's not, it's not atzvud. It's not a depression. A depression is when someone just gets stuck and they can't move forward and they just feel their loneliness. They feel there's no hope. That is not part of our service of Hashem. We cannot let that enter our lives. That's what he takes those ashes, the depression type of ashes. He takes them all the way outside of the camp. This doesn't belong to the Dash. But there is a certain type of psalat of the ashes that could be placed next to the Mizbeach. That's the bitterness. That's the type of... Now, again, we're in of, Elul. You see, how can I become better at learning Torah? How can I do more acts of kindness to my day? I don't feel like I'm doing enough. I want to do more. I, I, I need to take care of myself more. I'm being more healthy. And you're upset. But it's a good upset because you have, you're going to make a plan. And you're going to do Teshuvah. And you're going to become closer to who you really want to be. And then the Simcha is so great. So this is the ashes that stayed in the base of Mikdash. So but we have to remember the ashes that are just depression and just get that just gets stuck. You're not going anywhere with it. Just feel so hopeless. There's no place for that in the service of Hashem. That has to be removed totally outside the camp. Now, what happens after the Kohen? I think it's a different type of truck. It'll be as long as it was. Okay, what happens after the Kohen? Um, does this Truma Sadasha and he takes the ashes, he has to change his clothing. Rashi explains, why does he have to change his clothing? Why does he have to remove the garments that he did the ashes in and then put on new garments before doing the rest of the service? So Rashi, the commentary on the Torah, explains it's like a person who cooks for the king. He wears one type of clothing when he's cooking in the kitchen and getting prepared for the, but then he changes his clothing when he's actually walking into the royal dining room and serving the king. This is two different types of services. Even though it's not even the practical side because they are going to get dirty when they're doing it. The rest of it's also slaughtering. It's the part of the sacrifice, but still it's two different services. So here also Hasidus explains the idea of mirirut, of having that bitterness, it's important. But it's only a preparation for the greatest joy that we need to have when we serve Hashem, when we're davening, when we're learning. It's just a preparation to bring me to a higher level. I have to change my clothing afterwards. That's not the real main part of the service. A Jew doesn't belong walking around all day. Oh, yeah, I need to be a better person. Oh, this is so bad. That's, that's, we have to serve Hashem with joy. Those moments that we plan for of saying, you know, I want to do something better. Great, but then we change after. We right away have to have simcha after when we're serving Hashem. And, and davening and learning. Um, then, then just one more of the service uh, that in the Beit HaMikdash was that even though the fire that descended on the Mizbeach was a miraculous fire, it never extinguished and it came down like a huge fireball from heaven and it stayed there. There was still the part of the service where they had to bring the wood every day to feed the fire. You think, why did they need the wood? This is a miraculous fire. So again, according to Hasidus, what does this mean? We all have these fireball moments during our day. You could be standing in Shalom Yom Kippur or a big miracle happens or you had a dream. It's like, whoa, I feel Hashem. I love Hashem. This is amazing. And you feel like you want to just do every mitzvah and learn so much Torah. That's beautiful. But we have to also have a part of our service that just keeps on adding the wood. Our daily routine, whether we're feeling like so inspired or like we just heard something amazing, a great story and I want to give a lot of tzedakah or whether it's like, oh my gosh, it's just like such a bad day. I, I, I don't know. Keep putting the wood. Keep doing your part because Hashem's going to give you the fire. Some days it's going to feel like a huge fire. Some days it's going to be you're going to do that hard work to have that simcha. And to, but it's, we have to keep that routine even though the fire really, it comes from Hashem. So Hashem should bless us to be able to really recognize that base of Mikdash inside of us and constantly be you know, adding that wood and recognizing that true service is a service of joy. And that's really what brings us that strongest connection. 
And especially as we get close to Tisha B'Av, we, we know, we have to have that confidence and that simcha that there's no question that this Shabbos, we're actually going to be in the Beis HaMikdash HaShlishi. Like, oh, wow. that's the most realistic thing to look at this world. Like, <laughs> it's not a dream. It's the, really the reality. Like, everything else, there's no answers. Like, this, that, that, the new Delta, that, that. Look, the whole world is crazy. But what really is the truth is that Mashiach is coming. That we're going to have the Beis HaMikdash. And even just by learning it and celebrating birthday, a lot of mazel, we should have the Beis HaMikdash. So I'm so excited to introduce Miriam, who's going to go into detail of the different parts of the Beis HaMikdash. Maybe so. the one with it just because it's very sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I want to bring this. Oh, the Beta Mikdash. Oh, wow. This class. Yeah. Um, this is online on Torah Anytime, also on YouTube. Uh, I also have a website. You can also go on it, um, yournewheights.com. First of all, thank you so much for bringing me out here. And thank you so much. You know, I didn't give a proper introduction. Miriam is a very well-renowned author <laughs> over, like, I don't know, 25 books that she <laughs> wrote okay. on marriage, on health, on the Beis HaMikdash, and 10 more books are coming out soon. And I've learned so much from Miriam. Like, really, she lives with the teachings of the Torah. So I'm so excited to be a therapist as well, who helps many, many people. Thank Apologies. you. So there's so much to say about the Beit HaMikdash, and it's really, uh, like, always I pray the words from my heart and to your heart. I'm meeting so many new neshamot. Hopefully we will um, uh, continuously... Uh, be able to uh, be bismachot and uh, many oh, celebrations man. and many oh, man. beautiful moments. So I want to just also touch upon a few things, um, especially regarding the message that the Rebbe talks about during these three weeks' time. Uh, normally, recording in progress. Um, when I remember and I recall the days when I was living in Israel such a heavy three weeks and even like during the nine days and even Tisha B'Av like we went from gate to gate and like it's just so much sadness so much heaviness so much like enough already you know and and then I started studying more the deep teachings of Hasidus and I started listening to the messages of the times because every generation there's there's a Rebbe that tells us like what is it today um, that we need to do to be able to um, be aligned with the like with the, the this time period that we are in. So the Rebbe actually tells us that these three weeks are not so much about um, connecting ourselves to the galus and the exile and the torment and everything we went through, but it's really about. These three weeks are about preparation for the Geula so that we can shift what used to be like we, the crying, oh, so much sadness, so much heavy heartedness. Now the Rebbe actually gives us the permission to say, look, on the timeline of the Jewish people, we are so close to the ultimate Geula. It's kind of like when you're um, lighting Shabbos candles, the Rebbe said. It's like you're, you're, you're beginning an entry into the Shabbos zone. So it's not the time to be sad. It's like you're so happy lighting the Shabbos candles. So to be able to experience that type of um, transitioning. Recording in progress. So that's what's happening right now. We are at the candle lighting, the Rebbe said of the generation leaving that one foot behind and, and crossing over to the new era of Mashiach. And, and therefore, these three weeks, we're focusing on the Geula. And if you think about what we as a people have gone through, um, the Rebbe also mentions that, that like during the stages of our our you know, development as a people, there was the toddler stage and then there was the adult stage. So, you know how you act with a toddler. There's certain things you have to act differently than, let's say, your teenage daughter or, you know, your married daughter. So, 
God as our father, our parent as it were, dealt with us in the Torah a certain way because it was connecting to helping us become mature, helping us understand who God is, what our mission is. So there was a lot of um, seemingly disciplinary parenthood. And so now that we've had so many years of teaching, so many years of Torah and mitzvah, so many years of knowledge and understanding, now we can have the relationship with Hashem like an adult. What does that mean? When you think about a child, they may fear punishment. Oh, I better do this right because then I won't have the lollipop or I won't be able to go to Disneyland or, or I need to get good grades on my test because now as we have left that stage, we're ready for the real deal. We're ready to be able to connect to Hashem as a father would connect to their ch adult child. So it's not about fear. It's not about the depression or the sadness. I didn't do this right. And what if I'm going to not get punished? I'm going to get reward. It's about what can I do to connect to Hashem in a deep and meaningful way, especially now during these three weeks. Where can we do the tshuva? Have we been unforgiving of ourselves? Have we been too hard on ourselves? Have we carried too much sadness in the face of really the joy of what we could develop more and more in our relationship with Hashem? Do we feel burdened? Do we feel we're carrying such a load? So during these three weeks, we could say, where can we build our own Beit HaMikdash? And if you, what we're going to try to do today is while we're looking at the different structure, the different artifacts, and I'm going to do it pretty short. Usually I can do this class in three weeks, every week, but mm -hmm. Baruch Hashem, mm -hmm. I got a call, mm -hmm. And an invitation, I'm like, yes, we'll just do it. Even if it's just a, a little taste of some of the things, hopefully more that you will more learn about. So I'm going to actually go step by step. And if you see here, there's, a, and later you could see more in detail. And I have one also a little bit here. Um, where different parts of the structure of the Beit HaMikdash represented the day-to-day -day service that we do in our own life. So the Mizbeach represents the prayers, as you said earlier. What are we doing in prayer? Because now we don't have the Beit HaMikdash. Prayer is instead of the Beit HaMikdash services. So during the time of the Beit HaMikdash, they would bring an animal as a sacrifice. Alter Rebbe in Lukutei Torah actually says this animal represents the animalistic tendencies. So if a person had a very angry personality, they were arrogant, they were, they were very anxiety ridden. So they would bring up their ox, they would bring an ox to the Beit HaMikdash. And what would happen? A great and huge lion-like fire miraculously would come down and consume that animal. So what are we doing every day when we go into our Sidur? We bring up our animal. We do a little cheshbon. Like, what, what would I have brought if I went to the Beit HaMikdash? Oh, my gosh. I am, I'm a very stubborn personality. I would have brought a goat. If I had a very lustful, like, you know, I'm addicted to food or I'm addicted to shopping, whatever that may be, I would bring a sheep because a sheep represented a lustful personality. So what's the lesson here when every day we enter our own Beit HaMikdash and we pray and we say, here, Hashem, this is my animal? Well, guess what happened? The miraculous fire took away and consumed that animal. So Hashem is teaching us, you don't have to fix yourself. You don't have to like break your teeth and break your whatever, trying to like get rid of that negative tendency. Just show up for dominating. Just bring your offering. I'll do the rest. You know how relieving that is? Because how many times we're trying, we're trying, we're trying. We can't seem to break the habit. We can't seem to change. Because maybe we're relying too much on our own self. Maybe there's a little more room to say, I can't do it myself. Here, Hashem, I'm showing up in tefillah. I'm giving you my offering. 
I've tried so much. You know how I wanted. And every Yom Kippur and every, every day I go maybe to sleep saying, oh, how did I speak so not nicely to my child? Or how did I lose my cool with my husband? How did I nag? How did I do this? Hashem, I know I'm not going to be able to do it myself. I just have to like come to Hashem and say, I know it's you. You're the one that's going to help me. You're the one that's going to get me out of this. So that's the first, um, this is the first entryway into the Beit HaMikdash. And that was the Mizbech HaNechoshet. And the Choshet comes from the word Nachash. Because we're getting rid of our, our like snake-like, you know, the Nachash and Adam and Eve. We're trying to, you know, <laughs> sacrifice it and say, here Hashem, I don't want it anymore. So the Kior actually represents the next step, which is in the preparation, after doing the service, the, there's a bigger picture over here. And um, this was a service that they would wash away their hands and their, um, and their feet. And those of you who may not uh, may or may not know, this is also from copper, uh, from the choshed, which is from the word nachash, which represents now that I prayed and now that I got rid of this tendency, I want to make sure in the physical that the things that I do with my hands and the feet that are walking toward good, that it will hopefully my service of prayer will help me now engage in the material world in a good way because do you remember when the women were in Mitzrayim and they were uh, um, they would bring the beautiful um, mirrors that they had into the desert and they would like make themselves all look beautiful and they would use this physical mirror to arouse their husbands because the husbands didn't want to have more babies because, you know, Pharaoh wanted to kill the babies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Miriam stood up and said, what? I mean, that, you know, that, you know, she went to her father and said, that's, that's really not right because you're worse than Pharaoh, you know, by you separating from your wife. And by all the men that are going to follow your example because you're the leader, then there's not going to be girls into this world either. So they were directed, these women, from the heart to like do whatever they could to make themselves beautiful and arouse their husbands so that there would be children in the world back then. So when the Mishkan was about to be made, Moshe Rabbeinu said, bring everything that you want and whatever you bring it will be dedicated to the Mizbeach and to the Mishkan, and to all the artifacts of the Mishkan. So what did the women bring? The mirrors. And Moshe Rabbeinu was like, Recording in progress. This mirror? I don't know. This is like vanity in the Mishkan? So he, he didn't know what to do. He approached at Hashem and Hashem said, Are you kidding? These are so precious to me. More precious than anything that all the mirrors that the women bring, no matter how many mirrors they're going to bring, we're going to make it the size of however many mirrors. So here, this service showing that we use the material, the Shem Shaman. We use the material for a godly purpose, and it's so precious. We buy a beautiful garment for Shabbat. We will make our house pretty for, for uh, bris. <laughs> How many of those that we did? But it's not more. So that it's... it's once we are able to do the service of the prayer, now we can elevate the physical. Now we can enjoy the physical in a good and holy way. Okay, we don't see. <laughs> so, so that was the kior. See, we prayed. Now we sacrificed our animalistic tendency. Now we can engage in the physical world in a holy way. Next was the Mizbeach HaZahav. And this was um, the, the service of bonding and connecting to Hashem. It was made out of gold. Now that we worked on getting rid of our animalistic tendency, now that we got rid of the sadness that we're not so good, and we see Hashem forgave us in the prayers, and we have to work on ourselves to forgive ourselves, it's okay. 
we're not perfect. We were meant to be perfect. Now we can have like a more lustrous relationship with Hashem because gold represents like a red and it was like, a, 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 which represents love. It's not about, I'm praying because I need God to help me fix myself. Well, he tells us to do that. But the next level is going from the Choshet to Zahav to be like full of the love of Hashem. I'm doing this prayer because I want to bond with you. I'm doing this prayer service and I'm doing whatever I can in, in, in my service to you, Hashem because I want to connect. I want to be connected to you. So the next one is the Shulchan, which actually is the a continuation of the of the representation now that you really aren't struggling and battling again this is zahav and that zahav um had the loaves of breads that the kohanim would uh eat and it would be entering into this state of readiness in this in the shulchan, but actually it stayed like a whole week, and then they would eat it after like days and days of it being here. And every kohan got very little. So again, this represents taking the material and being satisfied with the what you have. And like, which we do learn, when you learn Torah, and when you pray, you get spiritual sparks from these services that you don't need to eat as much physically because these sparks of prayer and learning satiate your soul so that your soul doesn't need as many sparks from the food this actually comes from Kutur Sunayan one of the Rebbe's that said that if you have a challenging time like in the way that you're like attracted to the physical then it, it, it means that you could do even more service of Hashem in prayer and service of, of learning because that's going to satiate you so you won't be as drawn and as pulled and as helpless. <laughs> oh, it's a, a call for Hashem. I don't think it's going to work. It's okay. So... So uh, basically, this, if you look at um, the way the windows were created with the light of the menorah right there, it was concave. Normally, you know, windows are not concave. Concave means it's, it's like, it's kind of like, almost like, like almost like a, a cylinder. It's almost like rounded so that the light of the menorah could shine and it would shine from the beginning of Yushalayim all the way to the ends of the all of Israel. It was like such a powerful light. And so, and this represents our learning Torah. Because Torah brings light and helps you become a light and helps you become a light to the nations. And the point of our light is not for our own home. The point of our light is not for ourselves. It's for us to be an example to the whole world. That's why we're actually here in this. That's the mission. And of course, it's for our family so that they can also go out and shine their light. So if you look at the way here, the, um, you can't see it very, it's very small, but there were stairs here in front of the menorah. And technically speaking, Aaron, when he was lighting it, he didn't need the stairs to go up and reach the menorah. He could just go like that and, and just... And just like like the more the reason why there was these stairs up is because in order to really elevate and be a light to someone else you constantly have to like realize that if you're not inspired if you're like flat and not feeling it and just robotic like how much you can influence somebody else they're gonna feel it so you need to do your own work to be able to raise yourself up as you're raising others up now and we learned Baha'alatcha in one of the parshas, that was the message. Like, in order for you to raise somebody else up, you need to be raised up. And if you notice, while he was doing the candle lighting, his hand went from above to below, showing that I need to get the Torah's knowledge to be uh, like the nutrients of my soul, to be able to then draw down from above in order for me to light up myself 
and light up my soul. So the last part of the service is the Aaron, which here, if you see here, it's very cute. My daughter actually made this. And it would have three boxes and there was gold on the outside and gold on the inside. Mm -hmm. And then the, here was the Kruving. And there's many messages to be learned on why the three boxes and this whole message of the Kruving. So if you see here, there's gold on the inside and gold on the outside, you'd think, why gold on the inside? Save money. I mean, like, you know, use it somewhere else. Everyone could see it. But it really represented, like, once you do all the services of the day, right? You prayed. You, you tried to eat with a holy kavana, l'shem shamayim. You try to use a material in a good and holy way. And, and you try to really connect with simcha and, and uh, while learning Torah. And, and you really try to use the, the, the source of the power of, of God's wisdom to light you up. N now you can now be at a place where you're going to be gold on the outside and gold on the inside. Let me explain. How many times sometimes you really are gold on the inside? You really want to be so good to your children and to your husband or to your neighbor. You, know, you really like have good standards. But somehow that moment comes. The Eitzahara tricks you. The, the temptation of the pressure and the, and the chaoticness. And you lose it. And you're not so gold on the outside. Even though your heart... Every day you yearn and pray to be that example. Sometimes the opposite. You do the right thing. Even though the other day your husband may not have treated you so perfectly. And even though maybe even your child was a little whatever. Even though your bot, whatever. You did the right thing. But inside your head, oh my gosh, you're seething. You're like, oh, how dare he. I can't believe it. I did this for them and that for them. And this is what I get. Oh, Hashem. And it's not gold on the inside, even though you did it. You served them their meal. You did the laundry. You did what you had to do. So now, when you did the service of your day and you did it right, more and more, you'll be more spiritually, chiropractically aligned. Your insides will match your outsides. The outsides will more match your insides. Now the question is, why would the middle one be of wood? So the middle one actually represents um, the uh, ability to use everything in your life, even the simple things, even though it doesn't seem so like gold-like in a good and holy way. I'll explain. The, the, the wood that was, that was, the wood chosen for this was Ikea wood. Or I see it. Okay, now Acacia, because now everyone's eating those. Uh, oh, uh, Akaya. <laughs> it reminds me of it. Anyway, so shitim. yeah, shitim. So the wood is shitim, and shitim comes from the word shtus, meaning even you can use your silliness in a holy and good way. You know, they say that Rabbi used to say a joke, and I know Rabbi Jacob also says jokes right before he starts his class. And so it gets everyone in the mood, it eases their mind, they're like in a good mood, and now their mind is settled. Sometimes you'll see the dancing like crazy in weddings, and they'll do all this kind of funky stuff with all the, the props to make the Chatan Mekala happy. Again, these are like the simple, seemingly not gold-like things, but that are wrapped around the gold on the inside and on the outside. So we could even use these kinds of things in a holy way. Now, these beautiful Kruving, which actually I saw behind here, yeah, you'll this, see, like, I, I look like Kruving in the menorah, right? You can go and see it. I was like, it really made me feel like in the mood. Yeah, these Kruving, actually, you probably know that depending on how the Jewish people were behaving toward one another, depending that, like, state, would depend what the crewing would do. They were miraculously able to move. So if there was disunity, the, the angels with the face of a baby would turn away from one another. If there was harmony, the angels would embrace. So it would show like a barometer of where Hashem like 
is in connection to us. Because if because he would be so happy if there was shalom bayis and shalom between one another. Now, interesting, 70 years before the destruction, um, the Kruvim and the whole Aaron was taken in a chamber underneath the temple. And so we are taught that during the time when the Jewish people were witnessing the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash and, the, and all the artifacts taken out, one of the things that were taken out was the curtains of the Beit HaMikdash. Um, I think I have it here, yeah. You see over here, there's curtains. And then inside it was the Aram. And if you notice, there's these, these images of the, um, of the angels, the Kruving. So it wasn't really there. It was like a video of what was going on mm -hmm. deep inside where this Kruvim and Aaron was hidden years before the destruction. Because Hashem knew there was going to be a destruction and He wanted to keep the Aaron safe. So, to be able to show everyone how He was feeling toward the people, you would see like a video on these curtains how the state of affairs of the Jewish people were. Were they in unity or were they not? And what happened was, when the curtains were taken, you would think something so opposite of what happened. The Kruvim were not only toward each other, but they were hugging each other. So the question is asked, wait a minute, we know because of Sinas Chinam, the, the Beit HaMengdish was destroyed, meaning because it was like not so much unity amongst the people, so then how come the Kruvim were hugging each other? You know how sometimes a parent has to be disciplinarian? But it comes from so much love. You know how so many times like you have to say to your child, you can't go outside now. It's nighttime. We have to eat dinner. We have to take a shower. And it breaks your heart, but you have to say no. And you're doing it with such love. And it's for such a good reason. So when Hashem was in this state of, build, you know, in the process of having to do this, it was for the state of something so out of love. And that's why you had to show us, I love you. I'm hugging you through this. I'm going to carry you through this. And then another thing happened. When they were, even before taking these curtains out, and when Titus took the sword and slashed the curtains, in his defiance and haughtiness, a miracle happened and blood was oozing out of the curtains. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, so, so shocking. And the Rebbe of Lubavitch teaches us that this was teaching the Jewish people a big lesson that the life force of our people, the life force of the whole world is our learning Torah. And when we diminish our learning Torah, we lose our life force. We lose the blood of our health, of our people, of the world even. And so, the Rebbe was bringing out the fact that how come, out of all things, like if you think about some of the things that happened during other periods of time, they were doing bloodshed like murder, they were doing idolatry, Worshipping idols. They were murdering people. And the Beit HaMizah stood. And like they were winning wars. So what is it that, that because we weren't learning Torah. And we know learning Torah is, or not learning Torah actually, is worse than these three, crit uh, these types of uh, crimes all put together. How could it be? Murder? Idolatry? Adultery? All three? Worse than we're not learning Torah? Because learning Torah protects us from all those sins. So it's so critical that we learn Torah because then it will protect just like when they were learning Torah, but they were doing this and doing that and doing that, there was no, they won the wars, there wasn't a destruction. 
But when they weren't learning Torah, they didn't get along with one another. They were fighting with one another. There was disunity. And as I say, as a marriage and family counselor, people come to me and they go, I didn't call you as a Rebbitzin. I called you as a marriage counselor. I said, if you don't get these points that I'm about to tell you, how davening and learning brings you spiritually aligned with your soul, then it's your animal soul against his animal soul, and that's why there's a fire. One of you has to get aligned. One of you has to bring out your fire, your blood and your life force to fight for peace in a holy way. To rise above the temptation of getting enmeshed in that fire. As they say, when there's two people fighting, the Shechina can't rest in the home. So if even just one person steps back and is more quiet, and how are they able to be quiet? How are they able to tolerate the other? How can two animal souls get along? But if one has their godly soul more out in the open, because they did the service of the Beta Migdish day to day, every day, getting to that gold on the inside and gold on the outside, then the Shechina rests. And when the Shechina rests, there's a constant fire, just like on the Mizbeach was a constant fire. And that constant fire of the Shechina, which another name for Shechina, is Esh Ochelet Esh. Which means your holy fire that you ignited from davening and learning and being aligned and allowing the Shechina now to rest in your home, it will eat up and consume the unholy fire of the other. So I pray every day during these last days as we're really trying our best to get into that Geula mindset that you be the one to light your fire constantly. You be the one to be the menorah. You be the one to cause the Shekhinah to rest in your home and cause your home to be a Beit HaMikdash. Tamid. So that was very short, but you can see it online. It's a full one. Um, and this is very exciting because this is going to be a book very, uh, very soon. All this work that I've been doing over the years is finally getting to production. So hopefully you'll look at... Yeah, that's the first book. And I, I mean, I guess in a sense because it's Geula. Yeah, it's whatever it is for Geula. So... My mom wants to show you. I made this for guys. This is for my daughter. Wow. Look at the message she wrote. So Speak kindly. Leave the rest to God. Oh my gosh. Okay, I have to take a picture of this. Well, look at the person. Care deeply. Oh, oh. care deeply. Speak kindly. Leave the rest to God. Oh, I forgot about this since I went like that and I saw it. If you want to make these things with your children, I actually made this with my children. I took a cardboard, and then I put silver wrapping, and then I put a gold spray pen, and, and I found these. It was a game in our home, so I just said, I'll use it for that. <laughs> and I just uh, glued it on. Um, so there's a message to this, too, which I forgot, which is um, in, in the times of Mashiach, there's a discrepancy. And if you notice, some lights are their own color and some are clear. But on the on the uh, on the um, on the shoulders of uh, the Aaron's uh, his garment, uh, some say it was a, a gem of its own colors, and some say it was a gem that was just light and reflected other colors. So wherever he was, it would reflect wherever he was near. So the Lubavitcher Rebbe said that during the time of the Beta, uh, ultimate third Beta Mingdash, when, the, when we're going to get back to that state of affairs and when the Aaron is going to dress up with his garments, it's going to be both. Wow. So he said, why? And one more thing, uh, two questions. Yes. And what was kept in the Aaron Kodesh, the Luchot? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, the Luchot. Yes, and that's why the angels look down in... That's why I put this. <laughs> the Luchot, even though it's not... But... Um, <laughs> So the angels would look down because we constantly have to look at the luchot for guidance to be gold on the inside and gold on the outside. Yeah, and also, and I'm going to add here, broken luchot were also in the original, which also represents, you would think, ugh, the brokenness, the sins in the Holy of Holies? Because our weaknesses, our brokenness makes us have a whole heart. Every part of our journeys of what we 
went through and what we didn't do kind of ended up being a springboard to get us to the next level. So that's why the Broch and Luchot were also in the, uh, in the Aaron. Does the Rebbe say where are the artifacts now? Like the artifacts. I, I heard that there is a Vatican. But Some are, I, I believe you would know better, but I do and can say I had a dream during the three weeks when I taught this in 770 that the Rebbe came and, um, and I was like behind him actually. We were all following behind him and we went underground wow. and he opened the door, this big, huge, like stone-like door, it seemed like it. And all of a sudden the artifacts were beaming and he held the menorah and there was such a light. And it was such a powerful dream, I'll never forget it. Wow. And, I, and I was like down under seeing the artifacts. So some of them are and were stored underground before the destruction. And yes, some of them were taken and are going to be redeemed when Mashiach comes. So no one ever spe- specifies where it could be. Like the Aaron is hidden. The Aaron is hidden. That's why you cannot go on top. No, yeah, that's where the iron is, yes. and we are taught that it was purposely stored there before the destruction, because Hashem knew. Actually, Hulda, she was a woman prophetess. She was the one who gave the prophecy to hide the iron. Yeah. So it's actually there. The Romans didn't find it. But they did have access to other things, and right. I did hear that the Vatican has. Some, but I don't know. I don't know if it's any of the. I don't know if it's, it's like the dishes or. The, yeah. There were many menorahs also. There was a yeah, main one. Yeah. I mean, it was hard, in, the, in the courtyard. There were like right. lamps. So, yeah. for example, like Titus's ark, which has the round one. And anyone the out there one. that um, the lamps, so that's like the wrong shape. is into the Beit Hamikdash and wants to do like. A video based on what we just did here and showing the artifacts and what's I don't know there's uh, I just would love one day to do a video like that with just like very high top like beautiful art like imagery ah. with like uh, music mm. and with like you know sentences on you know this is gold on the inside gold on the outside that would be so amazing so I'm, I'm bringing out that idea here thank you everyone for coming and thank joining you so much. Oh, so I said the arke, uh, arke. the shtus. Remember we talked about the uh, sh- the keda. Uh, gold, wood, gold. So she was on the outside and the inside. And then in the middle was the wooden box, and that represents all the simple, seemingly things, silly things. Another gold wood, like another gold box. Yeah, there's three boxes. One here was gold. The next one was wood, and the other one was gold. Thank you. And this actually represents, you know, thought, deed, and action, you know. Chachma um, bin and Das, there's a lot of, like, you know, possibilities of really seeing how this is so metaphorically. Would the Renee Tzav be able to see this? Or only Kohen Gadol? The, uh, the Kohen Gadol, but the, the Jewish people would see the image of on the, the on the curtain, yeah. But the Rebbe says actually when Mashiach comes, every single Jew is going to have a turn to go into the Kodesh HaKadosh. Wow. Yeah, wow. Yeah, no matter if you're a Kohen or a Wow. Lady, wow, there's a lot of people woman. here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. But I, that's amazing. Uh, okay, thank you for joining. Any questions out there? Thank you for uh, your hospitality and opening us the house. We want to hear more on Yes. Teach us. Well, Bezrat Hashem, we have to. Are you. I mean, let's do it if you want. We to do it anytime you have Yes, Rita is amazing. Okay, so maybe we should do it. We should continue then. Yes. Yes. Maybe Tuba like in honor of Tuba next yeah. week. Yeah. 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 Let's do love. Yeah. I'm in. Okay, we'll do it next week. Yes. Lily, Lily, Lily. This is on Cat uh, so it's Cat Thank you. Thank you. I wish you were all here to join. All right, I'll say uh, see you later. Thank oh, you. You're so um, thank, you. thank you, thank you. Um, Tuesday, um, oh, Tuesday, I have a Zoom with my husband. Um, so Wednesday, I think Wednesday works.
Yeah, Wednesday. Is that Tubav, Wednesday? No, I think Shabbos. Is, but we could do it in preparation. Okay, in preparation for Tubav, we'll do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, a lot of. There's not to more people. There's not to yeah, amen. Bye. Bye-bye. I mean, a lot of people are here. I was so happy to see.